You're watching Strat News Global. I'm Amitabh Bravi. And it's great to see from Bloomington in Indiana, Professor Sumit Ganguly is a distinguished professor of political science and the Rabindranath Tagore chair in the Indiana University for Indian Cultures and Civilizations. Professor Ganguly, thank you so much for your, for your time. I do know it's been an extremely hectic weekend uh, with a lot of driving involved. That's correct, but I'm happy to be home now. Professor Ganguly, just uh, looking at uh, what to expect from the Biden administration and everyone's just wanting these this month and a little bit more than that to get over as soon as it can so they, they can actually get down to work. He's announced his, his first round of national security and uh, mm, nominees. There's also been the communication strategy nominees, all women there. Uh, Apart from, uh, you know, when you look at Indo-US ties now across the board, across administrations, bipartisan support, you, you look back from Bush senior to Clinton to Obama to uh, Trump in his own way, and uh, presumably Biden as well, uh, you, wouldn't, you would see a strengthening of relations uh, with India when he can get down to it. I certainly believe so, particularly because he has assembled a remarkable foreign policy team. Many of them are holdovers from the Obama administration, but the advantage is all of these people are schooled in matters of foreign and security policy. He also has a sufficient South Asia expertise uh, in, uh, in his um, uh, group. And consequently, I think one can expect a large degree of continuity and also uh, a, a movement away from some of the foolishness and the silliness that characterized the Trump administration, the nonsense that the Trump administration caused with the H-1B visas, the... Uh, uh, <coughs> the rudeness on the issue of uh, trade differences, those issues will go away under a Biden administration. And even if there are negotiations on those issues, those will be carried out through appropriate diplomatic channels and not through tweets sent out at 4 a.m. in the morning. Now, uh, another thing that uh, is kind of moving India and the U.S. closer together is China and its behavior. How do you see the Biden administration because of its past uh, dealing with China? Well, I think they received a wake up call from Sorry. China in the second Obama administration. They initially thought that they could uh, bring China into the comity of nations by tying it together into a whole range of multilateral arrangements and that this would moderate China's behavior. They were sorely mistaken in these assumptions and they woke up to a, a, a rather unfortunate reality rather late in the second Obama administration. Um, uh, as a consequence, I think they have learned and I don't think they are going to try and return to something like a G2, which was proposed, proposed by Zbigniew Brzezinski, a former national security advisor, and for which there was a certain amount of currency um, uh, for a while in the American foreign policy establishment. That, I think, is a moribund concept. It should not have been uh, raised in the first place. Uh, and it's a pity that serious, thoughtful people thought that was even a possibility. Now, there is a clear understanding that China is a strategic competitor to the United States and will be treated as such, though without the intemperate language that characterized the Trump administration. So you don't see him and the administration going soft in any way. There are some reports that uh, he has been advised, doesn't necessarily have to take that advice, to, uh, or that's coming in lieu of, say, Germany, um, I think South Korea and Japan reports suggesting that they could let in 5G or uh, let in Huawei, uh, which is what they had indicated that they wouldn't do because of the pressure that uh, Trump, the Trump administration was putting on them. 
I even if they let in Huawei uh, into the United States, which I don't think they no. will do. But mm -hmm. even if they do, I don't think that's going to change the fundamental geostrategic competition between the United States and the People's Republic of China. I think they have an understanding that the PRC does impinge on American security interests and must be treated as a strategic competitor and not as a cooperative partner anytime in the foreseeable future. And the PRC, the CCP, Xi Jinping's uh, policies seem to have uh, pushed India into uh, the U.S. corner, uh, at least in terms of when um, we are ready to do that, uh, or the dimensions that we are ready to uh, agree with. But defense cooperation, other cooperation, which has been increasing anyway, uh, it seems that China is uh, doing exactly the opposite of what it would want uh, the outcome to be. That's exactly the irony. Um, in an attempt to drive a wedge between the United States and India, uh, um, China has accomplished exactly the opposite. It has driven India increasingly closer to the United States, despite some lingering fears uh, in the Indian strategic establishment about American reliability based upon the experience of the Cold War. But what the Indian strategic establishment needs to understand that the structural reality in global politics is markedly different from what obtained during the Cold War, and consequently, American unreliability, which in large measure was driven by the unfortunate American relationship with Pakistan and the American reliance on Pakistan for the particular strategic ends on initially just generally the Cold War, subsequently Afghanistan on two separate occasions. All that is behind us now. And consequently, uh, the United States has emerged as a much more viable strategic partner for the United uh, for India, and the Chinese have made uh, a welcome contribution to that end, mm -hmm. even though that was not their intention or their goal. And now, the Indian Ministry of External Affairs won't would really like me putting this question in the manner that I am. Do you see Indian foreign policy now just wherever it is, looking solely at uh, not solely but uh, primarily at uh, how to counter China? Uh, we've seen how the neighborhood has changed uh, from 2014 when uh, Prime Minister Modi first attempted to, you know, make those uh, bridges. Uh, we've seen a, a spate of uh, movement, you know, from the Foreign Secretary moving to Bangladesh, Myanmar, there's a submarine that's given to Myanmar, there's other security developments, Nepal, uh, of course, the Chinese are also there, um, the Maldives, the foreign minister went to Bahrain and UAE, that may have a separate connotation, but he went to Seychelles, where India was trying to get a naval facility. The National Security Advisor has the first trilateral in, what, six years with Maldives and Sri Lanka. Uh, how do you see all that panning out? Is India needing to focus uh, primarily on countering China in various uh, spheres? The MEA, obviously, as you correctly suggested in your question, is not going to like the premise of your question at all. Yeah. Yeah. It is perfectly reasonable to infer on our part that this flurry of activity that you have correctly characterized in large part is an attempt to catch up on lost time. To, uh, despite the uh, initial commitment to a neighborhood first policy, the Modi administration failed to follow through in considerable measure and thereby lost ground to the PRC in the neighborhood and beyond. It is now trying to make up for that lost time.
to, um, to repair relations, to mend fences in the region, um, to ensure that the PRC does not continue to erode India's presence and footprint in the region. These are all welcome developments, even if they are a little belated, but it's better late than never. And I think this activity, this burst of activity, is a most welcome set of developments in Indian foreign policy. It will require now sustained attention, not just these visits, but then continued efforts to not just build these bridges, but maintain these bridges over time, because the PRC will remain relentless, especially now that it has managed to contain the COVID virus at home. And it's not just in the immediate neighborhood, it's pointing out uh, Seychelles, where uh, the foreign minister had, I think, last gone just before he had retired as foreign secretary, and it was then that the Azomshon naval facility deal had kind of erupted in the media and uh, the opposition in which is now in power in Seychelles had uh, scotched that uh, it's Vietnam as well as in, in the defense minister has a conversation and you're talking about training their pilots their submariners military equipment the stock of Brahmos to the Philippines Indonesia other ASEAN countries if not the Gulf so uh, there is a lot of uh, movement that can be seen as uh, <clears throat> Well, if not tightening the screws on, uh, on on China, providing some kind of deterrent. There's a two plus two, there's a quad. I mean, I haven't even mentioned those. Yes, this this is an entire array of efforts that are underway, and I think there is a strategic design to all of this. These are not just idiosyncratic yeah. moves on the part of this uh, government, uh, and instead it reflects a kind of a uh, strategy designed to counter uh, the efforts of the PRC, even if these efforts come a little late in the day. Um, that uh, they should have come earlier, uh, they should have been maintained over time, but that's water under the bridge. There's no point uh, going over what has not been done. What one needs to focus on uh, are the efforts that are currently underway, but the key issue is to maintain these and to sustain these efforts and not let them become mere flashes in the pan. Um, this will require a long-term strategy and a sustained effort because the PRC is not about to go away and they have the great advantage of having far more resources, both financial and military, that they can bring to bear. And they are not above bribery. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see the... Uh, the Pakistan angle playing out with Biden. I mean, it's not just his team. He himself has such vast experience, not just when he was vice president, but when he was uh, heading the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And even before that, he's traveled so much. He's got uh, Pakistan's second highest civilian award, I think, as well. Uh, how do you see with the dynamics hap of what's happening in the AFPAC region? How do you see uh, Biden uh, treating Pakistan? This is an absolutely fascinating question. To begin with, I don't think Biden has very many illusions about Pakistan. Mm -hmm. uh, as you correctly point out, he, uh, of his long service as chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, as a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, he was privy to the highest levels of intelligence uh, yeah. on Pakistan. Furthermore, bear in mind that he was in the Situation Room yeah. when, Abbottabad. When, when Abbottabad took place. So this is not someone who is naive about Pakistan by any means. Um, he recognizes the importance of Pakistan in terms of any kind of a deal on Afghanistan, but I don't think he's going to give Pakistan a pass. And furthermore, Pakistan's importance is steadily declining because even a Biden administration is not going to sustain a substantial troop presence in Afghanistan. Yeah. Um, it will, um, uh, in my understanding, I think it is going to continue with the drawdown, perhaps in not such a precipitate fashion as the Trump administration. But nevertheless, I don't think that this incoming administration has any particular stomach to see 
more and more American soldiers coming back in body bags in a war that seems to have dragged out indefinitely for almost two decades now with no particular end in sight. And so I think there is an appetite now to wind down that war without being overly hasty and uh, uh, squandering any of the gains that have been made in Afghanistan and simply handing the country over to the Taliban. You see that playing out. We've seen what the Trump administration and his handpicked man, um, Pompeo's handpicked man, Ambassador Khalilzad, was doing there. How do you see troop withdrawal? Yes, agreed with that, uh, uh, your statement there. But how do they deal with the so-called peace process, which is now in limbo, because I presume the Taliban are also waiting to see what happens next. That is still unclear about how the administration is going to move with the yeah. peace process. I don't think it's going to abandon the peace process, but I don't think, if at, if, at least if my understanding is correct, I don't think the administration will simply hand over uh, the country to the Taliban and take um, uh, sort of um, anodyne assurances from the Taliban that all will be well, because that would essentially mean the U.S. frittering away all the hard-won gains that were made in terms of the status of women in Afghanistan, in terms of development projects in Afghanistan, and above all, from, the, from a narrow American standpoint, ensuring that Afghanistan does not yet become another terrorist haven. That is why the U.S. went into Afghanistan in the first place almost two decades ago. And I cannot imagine that the Biden administration will abandon the counterterrorism mission, which was so critical to begin with. Professor Sumit Ganguly, absolutely fascinating having this chat with you. I could go on, but uh, we've got to leave some something for the next time that we talk. Thank you very much for this opportunity. It's our pleasure, Professor Sumit Kangli, joining us from Indiana. And if you do like our kind of journalism, do go on to our website and support us. You can also follow our social media handles, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook to get our latest posts. You've been watching Strat News Global. I'm Amitabh Brady.